I know you want to have lunch, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through this as quick as I can. Uh, the Women Who Shaped Wall Street is based on this book, which is a really, really great book. If you're interested in the, the impact that women have had on, all, on Wall Street and, and the struggle that they've had, this is a great book. There were no women on Wall Street when it first started. Women, women didn't work. They, women could not own property. You could not. You, they worked. Up, they worked hard, but they couldn't have a job, and they couldn't get paid, and they couldn't own any property. As a matter of fact, Abigail Adams, the wife of John Adams, the second president, bought Revolutionary War bonds, but she had to buy them through her uncle because she couldn't own property. And she had quite a few disagreements with her husband about it. She sneaked money from her allowance. And she earned 24% on her bond investments while he earned 2% from his real estate investments. <laughs> John Adams, when he died, had a nice house to leave his heirs. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison both died destitute and in great debt and lost their mansions to satisfy their creditors. So Abigail Adams did a great service to her husband. This was at a time, remember now, this is not far from the Victorian age when women wore bustles and corsets and things. This is a very primitive time. You, a woman couldn't own any property. She had to do whatever the husband said, basically. This is what a corset was. And you wore these bustle things to keep your dress from touching the ground in the back. Victoria Woodhull was very active in the, in the right to vote. She became very good friends with Susan B. Anthony, and they worked together for many years trying to get women the right to vote. Victoria was also a bona fide psychic, and she got to be friends with Cornelius Vanderbilt and made him $12 million from her psychic picks of stocks. And he was so impressed with her that he financed her to open the first, the very first woman-owned brokerage. In 1872, she actually ran for president. And Susan B. Anthony at that time was saying that women should be allowed to vote. Victoria was arrested a few days before the 1872 election. And uh, Susan B. Anthony was arrested for a voting in that election. Actually arrested for trying to vote for Victoria. Women were pretty upset at this time, needless to say, and they, uh, they, they, they wanted to be able to vote. They wanted property rights. They wanted reproductive rights. You know what that is? A woman, could, a woman had no control over whether or not uh, she could have birth control. You were supposed to just, you know, get pregnant and have a baby. And that was it. Uh, you didn't have a choice over anything about that. Uh, women also were protesting at the time about the fashions. They didn't really care about those. I'm just kidding. Um, Hetty Green, uh, as a child, she was reading the financial pages to her father. She was born into a wealthy family, and uh, she felt that she knew as much about finance as any man. She managed her own money and turned her, her, her inheritance into a huge fortune, she became the richest woman in the world at, at the time, accumulating $200 million. She was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's biggest miser. She refused to wash her underwear. She figured that she would only change it when it wore out. And she instructed her servants to only wash the portion of the clothes that were dirty in order to save soap. Needless to say, that's why she was branded as the world's biggest miser. They called her the Witch of Wall Street because she was so clever that she would outdo so many men in her business dealings. Um, but uh, her obituary brought out the fact that if it had been a man, um, they wouldn't have been remarkable traits. She was just a very, very good businesswoman. And they, and they really gave her a hard time because a lot of men lost business deals to her. Susan B. Anthony died in 1906 before women could get the vote, but the protests went on. 
This was a protest in uh, July the 14th, 1917, and a lot of the women were arrested. The protests were really got to be pretty serious, and women were really upset that they couldn't vote. And uh, uh, there, needless to say, any Wall Street jobs for women were menial jobs, uh, counting, you know, figure, holding ticker tapes and things like that. And uh, you just, there were no, no executives. It was in, inconceivable at the time. Finally, on August 26, 1917, 19, 19, uh, that's a 20, I'm sorry, 1920, that's a misprint. The 19th Amendment said women could vote. And they were pretty happy about it. And then fashions got a little better. Um, and the roaring 20s, the things were looking up. This was a lady in the 30s who, uh, Isabel Benham, was started off as a railroad analyst on Wall Street. And uh, she got to be really, really good at it and was the first woman to be named a partner at a Wall Street bond house. And uh, she was, uh, at the time, working for a boss, she said, who life made her, uh, made her life difficult. And uh, this is a picture of her at 100 in, two in 2009. I don't really know if she's still alive. I saw uh, something on the internet that said something about her. She was, and I don't know if she's still alive, but this was her th uh, three years ago at 100. Now, this book was really something, uh, The Feminine Mystique, because in 1963, uh, Betty Friedan uh, really started a social revolution because at after the war, women were encouraged to be a homemaker and just go have some children and, and raise a family. It wasn't, it wasn't in the psyche at the time to tell women to go out and get work. Men were supposed to work. Women were supposed to be homemakers. She wrote a book that said, uh, dispel that myth that, uh, that women uh, should be, uh, seek opportunities for themselves. She founded the National Organization for Women she fought uh, abortion for abortion rights, and uh, she was really, really uh, very instrumental at the time. Women, you don't see, I don't think you can see a single woman on the trading floor. Um, and then Muriel Siebert came along. Uh, she uh, started as an analyst and gradually worked her way to where she started her very own, uh, got a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. She had great difficulty getting the money to pay the 445000 because the New York Stock Exchange wanted her to prove she had the money and the bank wanted to pr her to prove she had the seat. So they, she, she was going back and forth between the two. Uh, on August the 26, 1970, 50 years after the right to vote, women were still trying to get into the workplace. They were not being, they were not able really to able to get in and have a really, really good job. Uh, most of the men were not happy about this because none of those guys got dinner that night. Uh, Betty, uh, Betty was uh, very instrumental in the Equal Rights Amendment, which to this day has not been passed. Wow. It's not been ratified by enough states to be an amendment yet, the Equal Rights Amendment, that guarantees women equality if you can believe that. Uh, so, and, and this is just a picture of, of some of the protests that were going on at the time. This is probably the most interesting slide that I have because it really points to the problem. This is a New York Times article about a lady who was helping to implement computer trading instead of those cards that they originally started off with cards. And so here's a lady that was, they were showing her, she was a lady that knew all about that, was an expert in it, and she was using the slide rule and, 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 and helping with the computer stuff. And they describe her in this article, attractive girl with hazel eyes and ash blonde hair. It's distracting to have such a pretty girl, a trim five feet, three inches tall in a size seven dress. This is in a Wall Street article. They're talking about this, they're talking about her physical characteristics. They're totally talking about her as a sex object. Men wanted women to take care of the baby. 
women, and this is when the first sex, sexist and sexism was first used in 1968. That's when the first term was used. They invented that term in that, at that time. And this was the basic, the basic problem. Men wanted women <laughs> to be, <laughs> they wanted women to be, you know, this is a cave woman. I doubt seriously that women didn't look like that back then. You know. um, anyway, going back to series of uh, Muriel Siebert. I have a, I have a two-minute video of Muriel that I'd like to show you. My application turned the street upside, so I learned that language and still use it. I had to have two languages. If I was dealing with the trader, every other word had to be a four-letter word. So I learned that language and still use it. I was great at math. I can look at a page of numbers and they light up and tell me a story. Growing up, I was visiting New York and I visited the New York Stock Exchange. We were on the balcony looking down at the floor. I said, you know, this looks exciting. Maybe if I come to New York, I'll get a job on Wall Street. And I came with a used car and $500. I was an analyst on a salary, but at the same time, these institutions were giving me orders. And I had a following, but I got about 60% of what the men got. I asked one of my clients, what large firm could I go to where I'll be paid equally? And he said, don't be ridiculous. You won't. Buy a seat, work for yourself. My application turned the street upside down. And they said, we've never had a woman apply. Nobody would dare to apply. I was creating something no one had ever done before. Some of the men thought a woman had no place on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And yet there were men who bent over backwards because they saw I was serious and I was doing the job and I wasn't there to play around. The toughest trader said to me, I really enjoy when I call you and give you an order. And I go home at night and I tell my daughter and my wife. We were opening doors, and the doors have opened and opened dramatically. Women are coming up very fast and running money. When I was growing up, money was not a proper subject for ladies. They don't talk that way today. Now, this is to give you the kind of lady that she is. Um, she... Sh she shares half of her firm's profit from new securities underwriting with the charities of the issuer's mm -hmm. choice. How many men do you know that do that? Men, as investors, are more often looking for the quick pop. They want to make a fast buck. Women, according to these books that I've been reading, are more conservative longer-term investors more looking for value than a quick pop. Would layman sisters have failed? <laughs> Is in this book, you know, it's really, really interesting. Uh, just to give you an example, I'll, I'll quickly scroll through these, but to give you an example, here's a CEO, a lady, a CEO of, of, of a city, private city group, CFO of BlackRock, President F Fidelity Financial Services, CFO of Morgan Stanley, co-head of securities Goldman Sachs, vice chairman of, of Barclays, co-head of global capital markets at B of A Merrick Lynch, Ellen Phillip, who's with us today for 32 years in the business here. Uh, and they end it with, we may soon need affirmative action for men. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs>